Well, I, today we are beginning, as we have said, a, a brand new sermon series. Uh, it is entitled On Marriage, uh, and in the coming weeks we're going to be looking at um, what Moses and Solomon and Jesus and Paul uh, had to say about this very important uh, topic. And just to let you know up front, this series uh, will not be exhaustive. There's other passages and texts that we could look at, but I do hope it will be comprehensive. And hopefully it will be of benefit, not just to those who are married, but to all of us, because we're all impacted by marriages, and it plays a vital role in our life uh, as a church uh, family. So this morning, uh, we are beginning with what Moses said on marriage from Genesis 2.24, so I trust your Bibles are open there. Genesis 2.24 is where we're going to focus our attention today. <clears throat> You've probably heard the saying, big things come in little packages. That's true if you're talking about microchips, newborn babies, Spud Webb, if you remember him, and engagement rings. But the same can also be said about our passage today. I am personally convinced that Genesis 2.24 is one of the most underestimated verses in the entire Bible. I've spent years in premarital counseling and just personal study looking at this verse in a hundred different ways, and I have still yet to exhaust its teaching. And I honestly cannot overemphasize how significant this single verse is when it comes to the topic of marriage. For instance, when Malachi the prophet talked about marriage, he alluded to Genesis 2, 24. When the Apostle Paul talks about marriage, he cites in the epistles Genesis 2, 24. When the Lord Jesus Christ talked about marriage, he quoted from Genesis 2, 24. The cornerstone of human civilization is marriage, and the cornerstone of marriage is Genesis 2, 24. So if we're going to look at this topic in the coming weeks, we must stop where, uh, we must begin where everyone in the scriptures begins, and that's with this very important passage. It's a small verse that contains some big, big teaching. You say, how many big teachings? Today, I'm going to show you 13. So buckle up. Now, before we jump in, two quick things. Number one, have you ever heard anybody use the expression, a death by a thousand cuts? Okay. There's a lot of sermons on marriage that, in my opinion, they die a death by a thousand qualifications. So let me just say up front, I, I know marriage is messy. And I know there's more passages than this one. And there's lots of unique situations to take into account. But I want to be clear this morning, I am focusing on marriage prior to the fall. I'm not talking about marriage the way it is. I want to focus on marriage as the way it was supposed to be. So that means I'm going to speak at times today in some very black and white terms, kind of absolute terms, but that's because I'm talking about marriage as God intended. So please don't come up to me afterward and say, yeah, but what about this? What about that? I know there's other things in the Bible. I want to take a look at this one passage because every New Testament, every prophet, when they talk about marriage, they come back to this verse. Also, if you're new to Forrest, I'm going to mention something throughout the sermon that you may not be familiar with. Have I ever mentioned the Baptist faith and message up here? It's a, it's a joke. Uh, I'm going to stop mentioning it when some of y'all read it, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, the Baptist faith and message is a, a, a summary of what we believe as a church. Article 18 is called On Family. I'm going to, you're going to hear me a bunch say, Article 18, Article 18. I'm quoting from our doctrinal statement. So I just want you to hear, as a church, these are things we already uh, have, have avowed and affirm as a church, and really a Southern Baptist all throughout uh, the nation. So I just, if you hear me say Article 18, I'm talking about our doctrinal statement. So, pencils ready? 
Let's do a deep dive on Genesis 2, 24, and I'm going to unpack 13 truths from Moses on marriage. By the way, to help, the verse will be on the screen, and you'll see where I'm at because we're going to be moving quickly. Number one, this verse teaches us that marriage is God's creation. Marriage is God's creation. By the way, if you're taking notes, they all start with marriage is, so you can write faster. Okay, notice the opening phrase of this verse, for this reason. Moses says, this is the reason we get married. Well, what's the reason, Moses? Well, if you noticed early in our reading as we read this text, the verse here, this verse doesn't quite fit the passage. Moses was telling the story of creation, of like things that happened, and then here in verse 24, he throws in this parenthetical thought, this little aside. Genesis 2 is a story. Genesis 2.24 is a commentary on the story. In other words, Moses here is rooting our theology of marriage in the history of creation. And that's where we must begin. Go back to verse 15 and let me show you what he means by the phrase for this reason. Look at verse 15. Notice what it says. Then the Lord God took the man. Then look at 16. Then the Lord God commanded the man. Look at 18. Then the Lord God said. Look at 19. Out of the ground the Lord God formed. Look at 21. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. Look at 22, the Lord God fashioned the rib into a woman. And at the end of 21, it was the Lord God who brought her to the man. All that leads us to the phrase in verse 24, for this reason. So again, what's the reason we get married? Moses says it's because God made the man and God made the woman and God also made the union of the man and the woman. I think we should update our children's Sunday school curriculum. Think about what you learned as a kid. Your Sunday school teacher would say, oh, boys and girls, in creation, God made light on this day, and he made uh, water on this day, and he made flying animals on this day. And then we say, on, on day six, God made animals, and he made humans. That's true, totally true. But did you notice in the text, on day six, God also literally created marriage. He actually built it into the system before the fall. Marriage does not exist because of evolutionary processes. It does not exist because of sociological influences. It does not exist because of legislative policy. Marriage exists because of God. He has a divine patent on marriage. He alone has the intellectual property for what marriage is and determines what it is to be. That's why Article 18 says, quote, marriage is God's unique gift to us. We didn't make it, we just received it, because marriage is God's creation. Number two, marriage is a common grace gift. Marriage is a common grace gift. Notice the next phrase, for this reason, a man. The text does not say an Israelite man. It doesn't say a Christian man. It simply says a man. That's because marriage is a blessing that's available to all people everywhere. The Catholic Church has been an ally on this issue, and I, for one, am thankful for that. At the same time, I personally think they go a little too far in labeling it as a sacrament. Sacraments are something that are the church's domain. But marriage, if you notice, is not just a church thing. Marriage is a creation thing. It's a good gift from a good God that's good for everybody. So like laughter and sunsets and children and fried chicken and cat videos on YouTube, everybody gets to enjoy it, all right? That's called common grace. Article 18 says God has ordained the family as the foundational institution of human society. Hebrews 13 says marriage is to be held honorable among all. That means Baptists get married and Hindus get married and Canadians get married and Bermudans get married. 
Old folks get married, young folks get married, and we are all better off because of it. So the upside is everybody can enjoy it. The downside is anybody can distort it. So watch this. Because marriage is a common grace gift, and because marriage is the building block of society, that's precisely why the church has to engage this issue in society. This is the reason that we can't just preach this way. We need to vote this way. Because it ultimately matters for society as a whole for everyone. This is why striking down the Bipartisan Defense of Marriage Act a few years ago was not just an issue of judicial legislation, it was an issue of judicial sin. Because although we, quote, knew the ordinances of God in creation, we gave hearty approval to those who rebelled against God's creation. The Supreme Court didn't create marriage, therefore the Supreme Court doesn't define marriage. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. We will gladly render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but marriage has never belonged to Caesar. Marriage is a common grace gift that we must engage in society because it's a common grace gift and also because it's God's creation. Number three, marriage is exclusively heterosexual. Marriage is exclusively heterosexual. Notice two words in this verse, verse 24. There's the word man, for this reason a man, and it's paired up with the word wife. Marriage assumes, verse 24, a union of two people, each of a different gender. I didn't highlight it on the screen, but you will also notice if you look closely at that verse, God also speaks of father and mother. So the binary language of this verse is repeated twice, making it crystal clear what God intended from the beginning. The Bible teaches that God made the two genders, male and female. Not only that, He also made the man a man, and He made the woman a woman. There's a sameness about the man and the woman in terms of value and importance and image of God, There's also a difference about the man and the woman in terms of biology and roles. And those are clearly on display in marriage. Article 18 says marriage is the uniting of one man and one woman. Kevin DeYoung, I think, does a great job explaining it this way. He says, quote, marriage is not the union of any two persons. It is a reunion of of two persons who are a complementary pair. You say, wait, 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 what? Watch this. He's talking about Genesis 2. Remember what happened. God made the man, right? Then from the man he took a rib, right? And from the rib he made a woman, right? And then he brought the woman to the man. So out of one flesh, God made two fleshes and then reunited the two fleshes and said, now go make another flesh. It was the reuniting of a pair that he designed to be complementary to one another. So the differences between a man and a woman, a husband and wife, they are not incidental to marriage. They are essential to the design of marriage. This is why, and this is my one implication here, and I'm not really, I'm genuinely not trying to be snarky by this, but on a personal note, this is why I, if I ever refer to same-sex marriage, I will put it in quotes or refer to it as so-called same-sex marriage. Because it may be legal marriage, but it's not actual marriage. Because marriage is exclusively heterosexual. Number four, marriage is designed around male leadership. Marriage is designed around male leadership. Notice the next phrase, for this reason, a man shall lead. Notice the man is mentioned before the wife, just as the father is mentioned before the mother, but also it's the man who takes the initiative in this marriage account. This fits with the rest of the creation story. You can go back and read it later. Adam is given the unique role as the head and representative of this couple. Adam is commanded to care for the garden, not Eve. Adam is directly told not to eat from the tree, not Eve. Adam is entrusted with naming the animals, not Eve. 
Adam is spoken to first after their sin, not Eve. And Adam is held accountable for what happened to them after the fall, not Eve. The Bible is clear that the woman was made from man and for man and not the other way around. And Eve's sin was a failure on Adam's part. I think a good argument can be made from the text that we read last week in Genesis 3 that Adam was with her when the serpent did his thing and that he heard the whole conversation. And I think he stood in the background and rather than leading his wife according to God's word, for whatever reason, he became history's first passive and ineffective hen-pecked coward. Now, I know there's a lot of concerns about misogyny, and I share many of those concerns, but listen to me closely. You do not combat toxic masculinity with feminism. You combat toxic masculinity with virtuous masculinity, with biblical masculinity, with Christ-like masculinity. Article 18 says, quote, The husband has the God-given responsibility to provide for, to protect, and to lead his family. So men, your job, as I've said before, is not to be the thermometer in your family, but the thermostat. Your job is not to reflect the temperature, it's to regulate the temperature of your home by knowing them, loving them, sacrificing for them, and serving them just as Jesus did the church. Marriage is designed around male leadership. Number five, marriage is the primary relationship. Marriage is the primary relationship. We're five points in, and I finally got to a verb in verse 24. Notice it says, a man shall leave. Not might leave, not could leave, not should leave, but shall leave. Leave who? His father and mother. In other words, the man and the woman leave their respective families to establish a brand new family. Now, sure, everybody has a family tree, and sometimes those branches are closer to others than at some times. Not, not everyone spreads out the same way. Read the Old Testament. They got married, and sometimes they would live in the same compound as aunts and uncles and cousins. You'd have five or six generations kind of living sometimes under the same roof. That, that's okay, but we must remember, this verse is saying that when you get married, you're not joining a clan, you're starting a family. When you get married, your extended family is no longer your primary family. Your chief loyalty, your key comfort, your primary counselor, your main friend, and your number one partner is to be your spouse. That's why your vows said, quote, forsaking all others for as long as you both shall live. Imagine a newborn baby trying to reattach the umbilical cord. That's ridiculous. At one point, that cord was essential, and the relationship between the mother and the child, it, it was unique, but there came a point, as soon as you cut the cord, you can't go back. And there's a sense in which when you get married, yes, you always honor your parents, but you now relate to them in a different way because you have established a new independent family. If that's all too vague, I'll be clear. Your spouse comes before your mama. And your spouse comes before your daddy. And your spouse comes before old roommates and childhood friends and neighbors and your bros online and your co-workers, everybody. And by the way, that even includes your children. Marital bonds trump all other bonds. Number six, marriage is to be modeled by parents. It is to be modeled by parents. Notice the phrase the verse speaks next of his father and his mother. Now that's odd. This is Genesis 2. Adam didn't have a father or mother. Eve didn't either. So what's going on? Well, remember, Moses is writing this book not during creation. He's writing this during the Exodus. For 400 years in Egypt, the Israelites were marrying and giving in marriage, but they didn't know why they were doing it. And no doubt they copied some of what they saw in the culture around them from the pagan Egyptians. 
And so God comes along and tells them, here's what marriage is supposed to be, and he gives them these opening chapters in Genesis 2. So this happened at the dawn of creation, but in verse 24, Moses is applying it in the year 1400 B.C., when there were lots of fathers and mothers walking around. And he wanted them clear that their job was to model this for their children. Now, it's true not every child will grow up and get married. There is a place in God's kingdom and work for single men and women, and the church must never, ever disparage that. But marriage is the typical situation in life. And so this phrase assumes that parents are preparing their sons to be husbands, and they're preparing their daughters to be wives that they're both parents actively involved in their upbringing and that they're even preparing them to leave and realize that is a good and healthy thing that God established in creation. Article 18 says, Parents are to demonstrate to their children God's pattern for marriage. If I've learned anything over the years in, in doing weddings, it's this, that eight weeks of premarital counseling cannot undo 25 years of bad modeling from mom and dad. I can show a couple, chapter and verse, some issue that we've got to talk about, and they go, well, you just don't know my parents. But the reason for that is, is because more, what we know about marriage is more caught than taught. We see it. We observe it. And so parents and grandparents, that's why you have to be on your A game because you're modeling something for your kids. So men, the best thing you can do for your kids love your wife. Women, the best thing you can do for your kids, love your husband. Don't give the impression that you're just roommates. The best way to be good parents is to be a great spouse. It's to be modeled by parents. Number seven, marriage is a covenant. Anybody else tired? I'm exhausted already. All right, marriage is a covenant. Notice that little word, be. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined. This assumes there was a moment they weren't joined and a distinct moment in which they are now joined. So something happened to transpire from them not being joined to now being joined. And that happens when a couple publicly pledges themselves before God and others that they're entering into matrimony. In the previous verse, that's what happened. God, or verse 22, God brought the woman to the man. And this vow was made, this exclamation was made in verse 23, and they were brought together in this unique relationship. Article 18 defines marriage as, quote, a covenant commitment. Scripture teaches this. Proverbs calls marriage a covenant. Ezekiel called marriage a covenant. Malachi calls marriage a covenant. The two people are coming together, not because it's a contract, not because it's a convenient, it's convenient, but because they're making a rock-solid promise to be joined to one another as God himself has joined himself uniquely to his people. This is why, I've said before, or this is why weddings have vows. This is also why, as I said before, I personally don't let couples write their own vows. Because when they do, it's all sunshine and rainbows and cotton candy. And it's the kind of stuff that you expect unmarried people to say about marriage, right, from the outside. In reality, healthy marriage vows need a little bit of sickness and death in them. <laughs> Why does that matter? Because this reflects Christ's relationship with the church that was rooted in his death. Marriage is a flesh and blood gospel tract. It's a living, breathing embodiment of the good news. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you may not realize this, but your marriage, even if you're, again, you're not a Christian, it is speaking, this temporary union is speaking of the eternal union that comes through the gospel. That Christ himself, a, 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 a spotless groom, gave himself to his bride who was adulterous. She was unfaithful and sinful, and yet he gave his life to pay for her sins. He cleansed her and claimed her for his own. And in that, he says, in my blood, I've established a covenant with the church. And he will never turn his back on that covenant. Marriage is hard. And, and yes, sometimes it brings some tough feelings and some tough differences and some tough circumstances to the surface. But listen to me. At the end of the day, your vows trump your feelings. Your vows trump your differences. Your vows trump your circumstances. Because you made a covenant before Almighty God to be joined 
to this person. Number eight, marriage is permanent. Marriage is permanent. Now consider the word here. Notice he says they shall be joined. This Hebrew word speaks of fusing two things together. Most of you probably know the King James word cleave. And so the two becoming one was designed to be a forever bond. It, it was intended from the beginning to be super gluing of two people together. Right after Article 18 says marriage is a covenant, it adds these words, quote, for a lifetime. That's what God intended. I know I've told you this before, so forgive me, I'm repeating myself now, but um, I, 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 you know, most weddings I do, they all have symbols you know, in them and lace and doilies and flowers and unity candles and all that jazz. I, I have a, a fad, I'm telling you, I'm waiting for it to catch on. Somebody needs to do it. It will go viral on YouTube, I promise. And while you're hiring the, the wedding caterer and the wedding coordinator and the DJ, hire a welder. And right in the middle of the service, have him crank up a blowtorch and fuse, weld two big pieces of steel together. That would be memorable, right? And everybody would see what it means to be joined in the Hebraic sense. See, to many people today, they don't think of marriage, watch this, as welding steel together. They think it's snapping Legos together. Snap and unsnap, snap and unsnap. But when you weld something together correctly, you can't tell where one piece ends and the other piece begins. They're permanently fused so that if you try to tear them apart, they're both going to be seriously damaged because they are joined. Marriage was created to be permanent. If you ever come see me for marriage counseling, let me give you a preview of how it's going to go, okay? I've done this enough times. Uh, this, is, this, this, will, this will answer your questions up front. Your couple's going to walk in, a husband and wife are going to sit down, and uh, I'm going to look at her and say, okay, what, what seems to be the problem? And she'll say, well, Pastor, I love my husband, but, you know, we've had some ups and downs and rough things. And, you know, I just don't feel like he, he works hard enough for our family. You know, we're always making end meet is, is hard, and we don't seem to have enough money, and things seem to be tough sometimes. And he really should go for that promotion. And, and, and he doesn't, you know, he can work more weekends and hours. He spends money on hobbies and things. And we just don't ever seem to have enough money. And I'll look at him, and I'll say, okay, what do you think the problem is? And he'll say, well, hon, but Pastor, you know, I love my wife, but, you know, when we got married, we couldn't keep our hands off each other. And now she's always got an ache here and an ache there and an ache there. And, man, I can't ever touch my wife. And we haven't been intimate. It's embarrassing. I can't tell you how long. And, you know, Pastor, it's just, it's just bad because she's always sick. And I'll say, okay, what do you guys think you're going to do? I say, well, we don't know. Things are hard and tough and difficult and whatever. But, you know, we, maybe we'll get separated. Maybe we'll see a counselor. Maybe we'll get divorced. I don't know exactly. And I'll go, hold on. I say, do you, I'll look at the wife and say, do you remember? For richer and poorer? And I look at the husband and I go, hey, do you remember? In sickness and in health. And they go, yeah, 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 but Pastor, you don't understand. We're cats and dogs and oil and water. It doesn't go together. There's no way we can do this. It's impossible because, Pastor, every single day, things go from bad to worse. And I go, "Uh uh-uh, for better? Or for worse, you covered it on your wedding day. That's exactly what those vows are there for. It's intended to be permanent, to be joined. Number nine, marriage is for sex. Marriage is for sex. Notice the next phrase does not say join to a wife or join to any wife, but specifically join to his wife wife. I'll try not to be graphic here, but the man's body and the woman's body have a complementary design for joining together. The same idea is included later in the phrase one flesh. But notice this joining together in intimacy assumes that you're united together in matrimony. See, too many of us got our theology of sex from Percy Sledge who's saying, when a man loves a woman, whoa, hold on, time out. It's when a husband loves his wife. But we're all so influenced by the culture, we start to embrace it. We don't see it as a big deal. But that's not what God intended. Article 18 says, quote, God provides for the man and the woman in marriage 
the framework for intimate companionship and the channel of sexual expression. God not only created marriage, He also created the act of marriage. God is not a prude. He co-authored the book of Song of Solomon. Did you know that? And it includes such steamy lines as, quote, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, and, quote, you have made my heart beat faster and faster, and that's just the PG-rated stuff. (laughs) Now, here's what I'm saying. Listen to me closely. Marriageless sex is a sin. Furthermore, a sexless marriage is likely a sin. 1 Corinthians 7 says that a husband and wife should only take a sexual hiatus if it is, quote, an agreed upon time for prayer. He then goes so far to say in verse 5, stop depriving one another. He's speaking of sexual intimacy. If you want a great word picture for that, 1 Corinthians 7, 5, go read it in the King James Version. You know what the King James says? Instead of saying, stop depriving one another of sex, the King James says, defraud ye not one another. I've asked my wife for years, could we paint that over our headboard real big? Defraud ye not one another. She won't let me do it for some reason. But but, but what's he saying? He is saying that you're robbing each other. You're robbing each other of what marriage was intended for. Our world, I think, understands how big a deal sex is, whether they realize it or not. Case in point, some of you don't know this, but at many universities, if you send your child off as a college freshman, they will go through an orientation process, and in almost every major university today, it will conclude a talk about what sexual consent is. They have so many cases of abuse and rape among college freshmen, they instinctively know there's crimes involved and we shouldn't do this, so there needs to be some agreement, and so they've come up with this idea of this fuzzy subjective thing called consent. Guess what? Consent is called your wedding day. It's a public declaration of consent. And right there in front of Aunt Myrtle and everybody else, they know that you're signing on to say this person's sexual pleasure is on my to-do list. Because God baked consent into the system. He knew there needed to be the agreement and something larger to, to hold and withstand all that, and that's why he created marriage. Number 10, marriage is a mutual effort. Marriage is a mutual effort. Notice it says the next two words, and they. And they. Did you notice a change? It's he, the man, she, the wife, but now it's they. Marriage requires teamwork. I said earlier, marriage is designed around male leadership, but the husband is not to do everything, and a husband who thinks he can is an idiot. Adam needed a helper suitable for him. He needed the woman to show him the rest of God's image. The woman who was equal to the man in intellect and ability and worth and giftedness and so many other things was not just important to what God was doing. She is essential to what God is doing. And marriage requires both people doing their part in the relationship. I have a book in my office entitled Friends, Partners, and Lovers. I love that title for a marriage book because I think it summarizes the three roles perfectly. Friendship is based on trust, lovemaking is built on intimacy, and partnering is built on cooperation. It means working together. It assumes mutuality and commonality. It's not dividing up the kingdom, protecting your assets, looking out for number one. It's about each person giving 100% for the good of each other. It is not built around a me mindset. Marriage is to be built around a we mindset. A common bond, common goal, common effort, common mission, and a common commitment to each other. Number 11, marriage is sanctifying. Marriage is sanctifying. Notice it says, and they shall become. So marriage is an initial commitment to be joined, but it turns into a lifelong process of becoming one. 
The day you say, I do, you're legally one, but chances are you're not yet functionally one. In other words, you're probably not experts at all of this on your honeymoon. Those early years are figuring out what that looks like. What does it mean to, to explore oneness in all aspects and facets of life? And this phrase here assumes there is growth. There is maturity. There is a continuing oneness that is developing and deepening over time. And the more the husband and wife do this, the more they see the oneness develop. And you should be cheering each other on as you're becoming what God intended. Marriage is God's gift to us, but listen to me, it is not God's ultimate goal for us. Too many people think, well, I'm going to get married, boom, checked it off, happily ever after. No, the moment you say I do is the moment the work starts. And that's because God's ultimate goal for your marriage, guess what? (laughs) News alert, it's not your happiness. It's your holiness. That is his goal for every one of his children. And sometimes the pathway to holiness in marriage, it can be miserable. Two quotes from the same author that I think help this. Gary Thomas said, quote, Couples don't fall out of love so much as they fall out of repentance. And number two, Christianity does not direct us to focus on finding the right person. It calls us to become the right person. So marriage is one more way that God is molding and shaping you into the image of Christ. In fact, I have a challenge for you. Next to the church, name for me a better training ground to learn about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Marriage is it. Marriage is a sanctifying tool in the hands of Christ to make you more like himself. You shall become. Number 12, marriage is to be monogamous. Marriage is to be monogamous. We've already implied this, so I'll be brief here. Notice the word one. They shall become one. The word monogamy comes from a Greek word monos, which just means it means one. In other words, this relationship has a distinct quality that no other relationship has. Oh, we have other friendships and we have other family, but this one is unique. To to summarize what one author said, he said, in marriage you're saying that you're the only person that I give in this way to. Now, yes, it's true, the Bible records instances of polygamy. But the Bible does not endorse polygamy. In fact, where the Bible usually records polygamy, just keep reading, it blew up in their face. Now, I'm not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, but mark my words, if same-sex marriage was the last battleground, polyamorous relationships are next. Hebrews 13.4 says fornicators and adulterers will be judged. Fornication and adultery are two different words. The Bible prohibits both premarital and extramarital sex because marriage is to demonstrate a unique fidelity of one man to one woman for life. Finally, number 13, this verse teaches us that marriage is pro-children. Marriage is pro-children. Look at the phrase, and they shall become one flesh. Back in Genesis 1, God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. That means God is the creator. We're made in his image to be procreators. That's part of the image of God in us. The two fleshes join to reproduce another flesh. And that's summed up in the words, be fruitful and multiply. Now, those words were not a suggestion. They were not an option. They were a command. The man man and the woman were fit together to be fruitful together. So unmarried people, listen to me closely. The decision to get married ultimately includes the decision to have children. You say, well, I'm not ready for kids. Then you're not ready for marriage. Because it not only comes with the territory biologically, it comes with the territory theologically. And any view of marriage that makes children an afterthought or optional is a rebellion against creation itself. Because part of the reason that we have such sexual chaos today is because we've tried our best to separate the recreation of sex from the procreation of sex, and it's just not possible. Now, I'm not one of those zealots who think you have to have umpteen billion kids, even though I have umpteen billion kids, all right? 
But I do agree with Augustine who basically said every time a married couple comes together sexually, they should be willing to have children. They recognize this is part of what God made this union for. Article 18 says, Children from the moment of conception are a blessing and a heritage from the Lord. And it includes family that are related by blood and by adoption. Let's remember, even if you can't have kids, there are other ways to have kids and to fulfill God's plan. The pro-marriage movement and the pro-life movements must go together. They are necessarily linked, not because of politics and not because of parties. They are linked because of Genesis 2, 24. So, do you see what I mean? (laughs) Big things come in little packages. Genesis 2, 24 is the cornerstone. Uh, And I have just barely scratched the surface. I've given you a lot to think about. So listen to me. Here's what I want you to do. In preparation for the coming Sundays, I want you to spend time, maybe today at lunch with your family, maybe someday this week, and open this back up, pull up your notes, they'll be online, and discuss what this passage says. If you're unmarried, speak with your friends about it. Speak with other family about it. If you're a widower or a widow, spend some time thinking about your own children and grandchildren and others that you know. Where does our thinking need to change according to God's Word? Where are the areas we need to grow in? Because mark my words, we absolutely will not, will not experience God's best for marriage unless our marriages are rooted in God's Word. And Genesis 2.24 is the place to plant the rebar and to start building our understanding of marriage. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning, and we thank you for how deep it is. Lord, it is good for us to pull out a microscope sometimes and to look at it, as Isaiah said, line by line, precept by precept, word by word because you have revealed to us everything that we need for life and godliness. And so, Father, we come to you having having looked at your word in detail. And, Lord, we come confessing our sins. Lord, no person in this room has a fully God-honoring marriage. We all fall short. God, we need your grace. We need your mercy. We need the gospel. And we pray that you'd forgive us as husbands and wives. And Lord, we pray for our children and for future generations and for our witness. May we go back to your word. Give us a backbone and thick skin and yet the simple, pure heart of Christ to engage this issue to the world around us. And Father, we ask and pray that we would be able, better this week than ever, to display the relationship between Christ and and his church. Because, Lord, one day these marriages in this room will all dissolve, but what will remain is Christ and his people. May we reflect that better and better this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.